tonight's speaker is Dr. Rita Augustin. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice here at Kane State. Dr. Augustin earned her master's and her doctorate in criminology and in criminal justice at the University of Nebraska. Uh, she arrived at Keene State in the fall of 2020, I think that's right. Um, and the courses she teaches here include intro to criminal justice, corrections, criminology, and upper level courses uh, in criminal justice, like the one she's got this semester in special populations. Uh, her scholarly interests research and research center around corrections, prison re-entry, prison-based treatment, and criminal justice policy. And her talk tonight is going to be called All Are All Offenders Created Equal? Examining Special Populations Within the Criminal Justice System. Please help me welcome Dr. Rita. Thank you for being here. I know it's a busy time of the semester, but so I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. So um, this is the outline for tonight. So first I'm gonna cover what is a special population. I'm throwing that terminology out a lot. So I'm gonna go over the definition and give you some examples of um, some of those populations. Then I'm gonna go over a few challenges for um, uh, the criminal justice system. So we're gonna look at police, courts, and corrections. I, my research mostly focuses on corrections. So that's where I'm gonna kind of, towards the end of the presentation is gonna be more focused on that area. And then I'm going to cover one special population that I've done quite a bit of research on, which is some older prisoners. And then I'm going to go over a study focusing on older prisoners that I've conducted, and then I'll open up for some questions. So first, what is a special population? So this is a definition that I use from my course, that, that special populations course that I teach. Um, so special populations are individuals that require special care, treatment, or management within the criminal justice system. So a very broad type um, definition there. So um, a special population is just not offenders. You know, I know I put that in my title of the presentation, but it could be anyone that's involved within the criminal justice system. So this could be victims, alleged perpetrators, convicted offenders, which I'm going to focus mostly on. And then um, criminal justice personnel can also be involved in special populations, witnesses and, and jurors as well. So this is not a inclusive list, but just some examples. So here are some special populations. Um, so the one that I'm covering mostly tonight is older prisoners. But you can see that there are many. And so when you think about these po special populations, just think about their interactions from starting with police potentially all the way through to um, reentry back in the community. So it can get pretty complex and complicated and challenging for the criminal justice system. So it's really important to find ways and to reevaluate uh, practices that are currently in use to make sure that we're properly accommodating these special populations. So I'm just gonna go over just a few challenges for um, each section of the criminal justice system. Um, there's a lot more and what I'm covering, I'm just kind of scratching the surface just because of the time limit I'm giving here tonight. So, um, you know, I just mentioned that when we were looking at the special population. So, you know, thinking about interactions with police, imagine being in the courtroom setting, certain accommodations these special populations will need. Um, if they go into institutional corrections, so this, when I say institutional corrections, I'm talking about jails and prison, and then community corrections would be probation, you know, parole, they might have other things that they are involved with, like intermediate sanctions, which is home confinement, getting residential treatment out in the community, things like that. So when it comes to police, there's a lot of questions that um, they should be asking themselves. I mean, I know a lot of times you have to make split second, second decisions, but some things for them to reflect on is when they come in contact with a person, um, what um, needs may the individual have? So for instance, the next question, um, is there behavior that's coming off as defiant? Is it really defiant behavior or is it just a symptom of something else? So maybe they're having some sort of mental health crisis. Maybe they are having hallucinations and delusions. That's making it hard for them to concentrate on the orders that they've been given. Or maybe they have an intellectual disability or a hearing impairment. So there's a lot of different factors or behaviors that can, might come across as defiant, but they really aren't. Um, also, too, looking at the use of force. Are there better ways to handle certain situations or maybe to um, gain compliance? And also, too, with um, types of force. 
some force may not be seen as lethal force, but they could be for certain populations. Um, example of this would be the use of tasers. If somebody has like a heart issue or maybe have a pacemaker, that can be lethal force if that is used. Um, other things too um, to consider are there are other agencies that they collaborate or contact if they are run across a certain individual that may be better for that person to get those services instead of being involved in, in the criminal justice. Um, another thing too is do they have the capacity to understand the situation? You know, one part of it being a criminal act is having that mens rea is that guilty mind, so meaning they had the intent to commit an offense. So first, do they have the capacity for that? It might be a little difficult to determine that at the time of the incident, but do they have the capacity to understand their rights? Um, when it comes to interrogation, um, what tactics can be overly coercive to individuals? So if somebody, certain populations have um, this urge to please people in authority. So folks that have intellectual disabilities or juveniles, they're really at risk of um, confabula confabulation, which is they kind of um, go along with a made up story or make up a story just so they can get out of a situation or get that approval from the authority figure. Um, all the way down to just even transportation. If somebody has a, a physical disability, is the back of a police car appropriate place to transport them? Or even handcuffing. Um, that can be um, painful for certain people that have disabilities. And then also just maintaining um, the dignity of the person. Um, this is a simple thing. Um, just using the proper pronouns can be something as simple as that that can really affect the person's dignity. So I'm just going to look a little bit more onto that use of force. So there's a study done in 2016, and what they did, they looked over media accounts of use of force by police, mainly folks who were killed by police, and they found that the stories that they looked at, so down here, the bullet put underneath, there's um, 2013, and there's 48 stories that they looked at, um, 2014, 70, and then 2015, 250 stories. So out of those stories that they examined, they found that a third to half of those stories, the people that were killed actually had some sort of disability. So one that brought up a lot of you know, issues right there. Um, one, we're not really having a data set that has been tracking, um, tracking if people have a physical or a mental disability, um, if they're killed by police, because having those stats could be really useful for training for police officers. And also, um, you know, trying to find other ways um, in order to de-escalate situations. And so we've seen that, um, I'm going to get two solutions in the next slide, that police forces are starting to do that. So um, why are, is this occurring? Why are people with disabilities um, kind of, you see here, being kind of killed disproportionately by police? Um, according to those, those authors, it could be um, this focus on gaining compliance and being trained in police academies by you know, using force in order to gain compliance instead of other techniques. So there's been a big focus on de-escalation. So finding alternative ways instead of force to gain compliance. So being able to talk people down and also to, to control your own emotions as well. Um, and then other things too, that um, they've been doing and it's been really catching on is crisis intervention training. So this is when law enforcement teams up with um, mental health professionals in order to collaborate and you know, give the person in need the best option. So this, um, the crisis intervention team might show up to the house as well as law enforcement, and then they might take over the matter instead of having law enforcement do that. Because um, the alternative would be um, for police, if they feel the need to take somebody in, either they bring them to the emergency room or to jail. And those are not always the best option for that person, um, especially because the environment can manifest more issues, especially if you think about jail. Um, and there's also um, another um, crisis center, so this crisis now model that's being put into place. So um, with this model, they have um, call hubs where so people can call this hub instead of calling police. If somebody's having a mental health crisis, they actually have mobile units that can go out to the homes of these individuals wherever they need to in order to get this assistance they need. And they can also bring them into these um, facilities to their crisis facilities. And so police, too, if they come in contact with somebody that might be having a mental health crisis, 
they can use these resources as well. They can take them to the facility and drop them off. It's actually way quicker for police to do it that way. It takes them on average five to seven minutes to drop that person off. Whereas in jail, they have to sit there during booking and the emergency room, they have to sit there until they can be processed in. So something that could take potentially hours, only a few minutes. So they found that it's been really cost saving these ways and then taking a lot of the pressure off of police because they're not mental health professionals. But a lot of times they've kind of been put into, forced into this role to act that way. And they found that the crisis intervention teams, there are about 2,700 um, communities that use this. And then this crisis now model too is, is kind of catching on. So some court challenges. So um, making sure that the people have um, you know, appropriate accommodations. So if they have any visual hearing type impairments that they're getting the accommodations they can fully participate in the court process. So again, whether they're the um, um, perpetrator or the, the victim or anybody else, witnesses, making sure that they have those accommodations. A big one is how to mitigate bias. And so I'm gonna focus a lot on the next couple of slides about bias in the courtroom, specifically for jurors, but there's more potential bias other than just juries. Um, and then how to make sure that they understand their rights and the gravity of the situation throughout the process. If they need any advocacy support within the courtroom, that they're given that. And then again, you just making sure that you know, try everything possible to maintain the dignity of that person throughout the process. So there's been some research done on um, using mock um, juries. So this means that they're not actually in the courtroom. People just pretend that they're kind of in the courtroom setting and they're giving different scenarios and they're asked questions about um, you know, how they felt about certain defendants and victims. Um, so, but they found that you know, depending on their disability, um, there can be some negative consequences, but also again, work in favor if you look at the last one. So more sympathy towards that, that group. But, you know, this can really affect um, people's lives. You know, if they're viewed um, just because of people's bias as more culpable, um, you know, more dangerous just because they have a certain disability or look a certain way, um, that's um, really unfortunate. And they also too, um, they found that studies of attractiveness, you probably have all heard of cases where people have gotten, defendants gotten a lot of media attention because people find them attractive, like Ted Bundy, for instance. Um, and so, uh, you know, people can be biased just because they find somebody attractive. They can be found, uh, find people less culpable. They can get more lenient sentences. But yeah, I know it's a subjective um, um, attractiveness is, but how does this translate to people with disabilities? Um, research has shown that people find them less attractive. And that has um, some really bad unintended consequences for those individuals. Um, and speech patterns. Um, also, um, I'm growing up with a speech impediment myself, <laughs> I know that um, I not only need speech therapy, I needed some individual therapy to get over some of um, my uh, negative emotions that came about. Um, but that can affect too people find if you're intelligent or if you're um, just emotionally disturbed for instance, for stuttering. Um, so it just really shows that bias can really have really um, negative consequences, more so than um, what people might initially think in the court process. So there's some you know, good news. You know, judges are there. Um, I mean, I know they can be, have biases themselves, but they're supposed to be uh, monitoring courtroom activity. So we have some sort of oversight, but they also have created specialty courts. So um, the idea behind this is put people into a court situation where um, people are working with them that understands their needs and give them kind of a second chance. So this is for kind of minor type offenses. So they'll go through the court process and the idea is to get their, their record expunged. So you can see, um, you know, there's other types of special needs courts, but you know, veterans courts, for example, really focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder um, and then all the other symptoms that might go along with that, substance use, um, and then, you know, sometimes their crime might just be part of um, a symptom of their PTSD. 
So it's having the understanding and being able to work with that population and giving them a second chance to be really beneficial. So there's a lot of collaboration that goes along within these courts um, in order to get people set up. So what happens if they get an individualized plan and they have to follow that plan. So if they don't follow that plan, they'll get put in back into the normal criminal justice process. So um, they follow this individualized treatment plan. So it's gonna be some sort of treatment they're gonna have to follow. So if there's other behaviors out in the community that they're supposed to adhere to, they have some conditions they must follow. Um, and it's really important that this be voluntary to get people on board um, in order to some sort of behavior change. And again, if they um, finish it, they get that record expunged and that's huge for them. So that means we don't have a criminal record. If you have a criminal record, there's a lot of um, barriers that you're faced with. It'd be harder to find a job, housing, access to certain things on the community like education. So it's a really um, um, unique and awesome process. And um, there's also diversion programs too, to try to divert people out and get them the treatment they need in the community. So now we're looking at um, corrections. So corrections is referred to as a system that cannot save them. If they're told to take somebody, they have to take them. So um, they're really unique, jails and prisons. They're total institutions. It means that they have complete control over those individuals. There's no other institution like that. Um, I always talk about in the classroom, like, you know, this is an institution, but you have free will. <laughs> you know, you can choose to come here and leave. Um, they cannot. So it's really important that. Um, corrections, make sure that they are um, giving, providing inmates with the things to make sure that they are well taken care of because they do have rights. So, um, I mean, we have our basic rights, the Bill of Rights. Some there might be some limitations on them, like um, the Fourth Amendment, for instance, unreasonable searches and seizures when you're in prison or jail. It kind of goes out the window. They can search your cell, cell and yourself, you know. Um, there's some limitations there. But we do have the Eighth Amendment and cruel, against cruel and unusual punishment. So the punishment is already being um, dealt out. They're there in prison. Um, some might be even awaiting trial in jail. Um, so anything above and beyond is that, that punishment level that might feel that way, it should not be happening. And then so in 1976, the Supreme, Supreme Court said that they do have access to adequate health care. So it's um, really important that um, correct facilities are making sure that they're doing that. And then also that they're abiding by the Americans with Disability Act. So um, that means that everything needs to be accessible um, and that um, correction facilities either have to be remodeled or if they're being designed to make sure that they're adhering with ADA standards. Same thing with other um, um, agencies like police departments and, and corrections. But this was huge for corrections when this came out because um, prisons were designed with young folks in mind, typically young males in mind. So they had to go back through and make sure that um, they were compliant. And that was really difficult, but necessary. So other um, questions that corrections should be asking is, um, you know, how to identify or screen for certain needs. Um, for instance, with mental health, um, this can be very difficult to screen for mental health needs. One, um, if they're not been diagnosed already, but sometimes at the initial screening, so what happens is you know, people are screened for mental health initially, but they might not have symptoms at the beginning or when they're initially screened and things can manifest and worsen just because of the prison environment. So you think about you lost your autonomy. Um, you cannot go somewhere whenever you want to. It's probably noisy, um, crowded, and that can lead to worsening of symptoms or things to manifest. So it's really important to not only screened initially, but at multiple time points. And also too, if they're involved in programming or treatment, the goal is to, one, assess for their risks and needs, but those should be going down their risk and needs level when they're getting treatment and being able to screen for that, to make sure that they're getting the help that they need within, within prison. Um, housing, you know, where should they be housed to promote the, their safety and well-being? Is any other accommodations they need? how to handle inmate grievances. Um, some prisons have been putting in um, grievance kiosks. So um, inmates can go in and they can just type in their grievance and walk away so that we don't have to rely on correctional officers to relay that information. Because 
correction officers can be really um, overworked and they can, you know, be told something. You know, we all, all happens, we're told something, they need something sometimes, and then we get distracted and we might forget that we're human. So this kiosk kind of take out that middleman. Um, and then, you know, transportation out to um, different medical uh, facilities or between facilities. So sometimes um, the medical needs of inmates might go above and beyond what's available within prisons. So they have to take them out to local hospitals. Like for instance, um, dialysis, um, you have to go out and get dialysis and come back. And same thing with like pregnant inmates. If they need to go out and during labor, how best to transport them. So there's been this um, controversy with shackling pregnant inmates. So some states have banned this at the federal level is banned, but some states still practice this where they're being shackled at their legs and they're shackled to the bed too during delivery. And that can really um, cause a lot of discomfort and get, um, get in the way of any emergency type situation if they need some medical intervention right away. So a controversial um, issue there. And then um, also to what programming is available, uh, making sure that people are not being denied access to programming because they have um, special needs. Um, and so making sure that they are, have programs available. For instance, in Nevada, the True Grit program is designed specifically for older inmates because a lot of even the recreational activities in prison are kind of designed for a younger um, Aimants in mind that you know don't have any type of disability. So, for instance, in the Trigger, they have wheelchair basketball that uh, inmates can participate in. So they're able to do things like that. Um, and then it's making sure that they're ready for reentry. Um, if they have unique needs, then make sure that they are being accommodated and there's things set up out in the community before they leave. So going back to mental health, uh, making sure folks have their, you know, if they're on Medicaid or Medicare, make sure that they have, that gets kicked back in when they get back to the community, make sure they leave with medication in hand, um, making sure they have appropriate housing for their needs. So there's a lot of barriers when it comes to reentry in general, but if you add special needs on top of that, it makes it even more difficult, more barriers there. Um, how best to supervise in the community, um, making sure, uh, Blood probation and parole, um, they have specialized um, units or officers that work with certain populations because they um, know how to better accommodate. So they, they kind of divide up cases based on needs so they can better um, accommodate those populations on the community. And again, just making sure that people have uh, maintained their dignity throughout the process. So some solutions, um, really focusing on training, just with police, that um, de-escalation training, um, implicit bias training is really important, even the crisis intervention, the, you know, the Board of Behavioral Health. Um, housing, they've created specialized units. So um, for instance, like mental health units, geriatric units, so that way they can put offenders with similar needs together, and that way um, the people on that unit are trained and better handling of those special populations, accommodating their needs. Um, medical equipment could be put in the same units that maybe multiple um, inmates will use. Um, and then um, restriction of solitary confinement. Um, there's been a big push because of all the research about how um, bad um, being put in solitary confinement for long periods of time is for your mental health. Um, so they put in a process of making sure that correctional facilities are um, have a paper trail. Um, so why is somebody put in solitary confinement and have a review process for how long we put there? And it's not using that, um, uh, just you know, saying it's for some, some um, inmate safety. For instance, um, transgender inmates typically are thrown into solitary confinement. No, they need to find better housing. They shouldn't be punished just because they're transgender. Um, other things too, making sure that um, research is backing up um, practices or even assessment tools. So we have these assessment tools to um, determine somebody's risk and need levels, but they need to be tested on different populations and validated. So a assessment tool that might work for um, um, white males might not work for indigenous women. Um, so be able to uh, validate those tools. Same thing with programming. Make sure that the programming that we have in place is actually effective. They're not just feel good 
programs. Um, and then um, reentry planning support, making sure we have individualized treatment plans that are doable um, and there's stuff out in the community that we're reaching out with other agencies and making those contacts. Um, the Second Chance Act, um, they provide funding to correction facilities um, to promote certain programs to help with reentry. Um, they usually have to partner up with the researcher in order to get those grant funds. Um, I actually worked on that uh, in Alaska. I partnered up with uh, Alaska Department of Corrections. And then this community education awareness. Majority of people, 90% of prisoners are gonna come back in the community. So making sure that we have buy-in from the community to accept people um, and not create more barriers, because if you create more barriers, this uh, could lead to more recidivism. So showing that if we reinvest in these people, um, provide opportunities for housing and employment, that could potentially lead to secondary crime prevention. And then also it's cost saving. The fewer people we have going back into um, prison or throughout the criminal justice system, the more money we can save and reinvest elsewhere. So um, now we're getting into um, older prisoners. I'm gonna go over a background of them. So they're the fastest growing prison population. The baby boomers are reaching um, the, their golden age. <laughs> and so we're seeing different ways people are ending up here. So we have some folks that are um, committing crimes later in life. So on average, we see about over half a million people 55 and older being arrested every year. Um, then we have also have these tough on crime laws in the past, in the 80s and 90s, and you see people waiting and sitting in jail because of these long sentences that they were given. And then we also have um, a conflict within research and between correctional facilities on what old, older um, prisoners actually are, what, how to define them. So we've seen studies as young as 40 defined. I know students might be thinking that's, that's old, but as faculty members. <laughs> so um, there's this debate of how do you define them? So um, within the ger um, gerontology research, um, there's um, this, you know, is it chronological age we should use or functional age? So chronological age is how many years old you are. Um, functional age is your physiological age. And they have found that inmates because of the stressful environment they're in, they tend to age 10 to 15 years faster. So somebody who is 40 chronologically could be equivalent to a 50 or 55 year old physiologically. Um, and then this subset of prisoners are the most expensive. So this is healthcare crisis going on within the prisons. It costs on average three times more to house than younger offenders and because they have higher rates of cognitive illness and disability. So they have um, a lot of unique needs. Um, so early onset chronic medical conditions, this could happen because of um, just lifestyle choices before prison. So maybe substance use, um, not having access to medical care, um, inadequate nutrition, and then you combine that with um, the stressful prison environment. Um, a lot of them have undiagnosed um, mental health disorders. The rates of serious mental health disorders varies between studies, but um, once they looked at it, it was um, about 20, five to 20% of older inmates have that, um, those needs. And then so, and they also have on average three or more chronic conditions. That makes them very, very expensive in order to, because again, corrections has to accommodate. If they know about a health issue, they have to make sure that they take care of it. Um, and then, so they have a lot of, uh, release risk. So if they've been in jail um, since the 90s <laughs> um, or even recently, their social uh, circles might be smaller just because of their age. So that means like the family or their parents might be gone, siblings might be gone. If they've been in jail for decades, they've probably lost contact with a lot of friends, people move away, things like that. So it's really limited social network. Um, and then they're at high risk for homelessness because a lot of nursing homes and since Olympic facilities do not want felons, um, especially too if they're sex offenders, they just don't want this population. So it puts them at higher risk of not having stable housing. Um, unfortunately, we have also ageism within our, our society and um, in the employee, employee market. So it's, they have their 
uh, criminal record on top of being older, trying to get back out into the workforce can be really difficult. Um, and then so basically all this combined, they have higher risk of mortality when they are released. So it's really important that they're receiving that support um, from corrections, community corrections, when they come back out into the community. Um, and so there's been lots of recommendations. This comes from a study in um, 2012. You know, really needed to, for correctional facilities to define what it is to be older within their uh, correctional facilities. And that's one study that I'm going to go over that I've conducted. Trained staffs and their need. Um, more screening um, for cognitive impairments, dementia. Um, you know, create standards for geriatric housing. And um, also, too, for release, we have a medical and geriatric parole. So these are special types of parole based on somebody's medical needs. So maybe they'll get better treatment on the community. Maybe their risk levels are really low. And um, compassionate release. So these are for people that have terminal illness. There's no way that they're going to get better. Their family can um, ask or petition to get them released. But if they don't have family, they're not going to get that. Um, rarely used. Um, I recently looked at some stats. They said about 83% of the time they're denied actually released because um, it could be because of the type of offense that they committed. Um, maybe there's a lot of, you know, the victims might not want or there's just this um, kind of pushback from the public to release certain types of offenders. And also just to, re, uh, to um, enhance palliative care, so the care for people with serious uh, medical needs within prison. Um, other um, designs of prisons, and you know, keeping um, these special populations, especially older than mine, when you're designing prisons and making it more accessible. Also, thinking about you know cognitive um, disabilities. Um, if you ever go into a nursing home, you might see the layout of the floor, the carpet, and the walls are painted a certain way. Kind of helps people with those disabilities navigate. So maybe those that would be um, nice for prisons to have units like that. Um, and then, you know, nutrition, making sure based off their needs that they're getting proper nutrition. And then um, victimization risk. Um, older inmates tend to be victimized of higher victimization rates because of their physical or perceived physical capabilities. Um, so it's really important to um, for um, corrections to make sure that they're properly housing them and safely housing them and that um, correction officers know about that, that risk. And then um, one thing I have a video on is care programs. So hopefully this works. <laughs> Why are we here? Why are we here? We're going back to the building. Oh, where is it going? That way. See that yellow building way over there with all the windows on it? Way down there? Yeah. That's where we're going? Yeah, that's your building. Directly there? Directly. Non-stop. Okay. <laughs> In this environment, they feel uh, afraid, left out, lost, confused. They don't know what to do next. Dementia is a fast-growing phenomenon in prisons, one that many are desperately unprepared to handle. The state of California is piloting a program that trains convicted felons to care for inmates suffering from dementia. They're called gold coats because they wear yellow jackets instead of standard issue prison blue. I think the biggest obstacle for these uh, Alzheimer's patients is the memory. A lot of them start forgetting basic things like what is a spoon for? They forget how to use the toilet right, you know? So what was for breakfast this morning? French toast. French toast, is that right? Y'all agree? Yeah. French toast, yeah, French toast and, banana, and banana. Banana? Yeah. Tougher crime policies have created a large population of aging prisoners. They may be particularly prone to dementia due to a variety of risk factors, including limited education, depression, and even head injuries from fights. You can't read a pamphlet on dementia and say, okay, I got it now. It don't work like that, you know. You got to get in there and just, you know, hands on. Looks like he's been biting his fingernails, so they're all crooked and chopped up. Don't be biting your fingernails. 
The dementia aides help with the most intimate daily tasks. Showering, shaving, even changing adult diapers. They work with inmates at every stage of the disease. You have to allow Mr. Gregory to come to you. You love just like I make mine, right? Just like you make yours. If I would go to Mr. Gregory and say, let me make your bed up, he gonna be like, no, we'll do it Friday. But not, but not all them blankets. He real independent, so I gotta let him tell me when he wants his bed made up. And that's cool, you know, because it's about him, not me. You gotta be friends with these guys. You know, it's impossible to just come down here and say, you know what, I got a job to do, I'm gonna do it. It don't work like that. You know, you gotta bond with them, because if they don't trust you, you know, it's not gonna work. The importance of trust among these men may be surprising, given that each of them has been convicted of murder. Many of them are serving life sentences and have been repeatedly denied parole. Samuel Baxter was convicted of murdering a co-worker. After a heated argument, he shot him six times. I took somebody's life, you know, so I just always run that, that day back. It wasn't anything I could have did to change that, I, you know. But I mean, the reality is, you know, it happened and I'm here and I can't change it, you know, as much as I wish I could have, you know, it happened. And that's just something I'm gonna live with the rest of my life, you know. Cecil Montgomery was convicted of first degree murder. I knocked her unconscious, tied her up and stabbed her. And I denied doing it for at least 17 years. I killed my sister-in-law. This program is in place because states like California cannot afford to hire professional caregivers. And people like Mr. Cruz often need care around the clock. He'll see his reflection in his toilet water, and he'll talk to it, you know, as though it's his brother. You know, he'd thank his brother right there in the toilet water. If that cell door is not open, I'm not able to, to distract him, to get him away from it. And me not being able to get in there, I feel helpless. Dementia can make people paranoid or confused, and the strict routine of prison life can exacerbate those feelings. I never take a shower. Matter of fact, you take a shower almost every day. I don't take a shower. You took one the other day. No. Yes, I you didn't. did. I didn't. Yes, you did. I didn't. I was there when you did it. All right. If that's the truth, then that's Yes, that's the truth. Okay. Well, that's what I have. Okay, here, take your socks off first. A year ago, well, I couldn't have said, well, you know what, man, I'm gonna go help this grown man, you know, get in the shower, who just, you know, had an accident. It humbles you. The California prison system would like to transfer demented inmates to nursing homes, but their violent criminal history makes the state reluctant to parole them and nursing homes hesitant to accept them. These aging inmates are some of the most vulnerable members of the prison population. There's predators among uh, these convicts that they don't care whether the guy's sick in the head or not. They still want what they want and they want it now and they don't care who you are, they'll get it from you. You know, for us, this is not a job, you know. This is a part of our lifestyle, you know. We, we live with these dogs and that's what it is, you know. You gotta care about them. Although two former Gold Coats have received parole, this role does not guarantee freedom for these men. You know, I want to get out, but I don't know if I'm going to ever get out. You know, because tomorrow I'm not promised to none of us. 
You know, I try to live a good life. I try to do right. I try to stay healthy, but I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's a, it's a long road to recovery, you know, and I'm working on it. For the Gold Coast, they now have those implemented at 11 correction facilities within California. Um, and they pay those, uh, the Gold Coast members, about $50 a month. So it's a big cost savings. And a lot of times, too, there are people that are long term offenders, they're going to be there for a while. Um, so they're kind of view it as paying it forward because maybe one day they'll be the one that will need those type of services. Um, and then other crash facilities too have been trying different things out. They've tried, um, um, for instance, in New York, a uh, physical correction facility. They've created their own cognitive um, uh, uh, unit for cognitive impaired. And then um, in Connecticut, they've been trying to partnership with nursing homes in order to help with that reentry. And then also getting that parole, medical and geriatric parole, using that and having a system in place, a partnership in place so they could send them to directly to this nursing home. And so this it, is catching on and it's really um, it's needed because this population is continuing to, to grow. So um, one study that I did with some other colleagues, it's uh, we were trying to look at, try to find a tipping point in which there's a certain age cutoff where misconduct changes, significantly changes. So, um, as I mentioned before, there is no standardized definition of what it is to be older in prison. Um, and we're using correctional data. So one of the main uh, behaviors that's tracked by corrections is misconduct. So that's why we chose to look at misconduct. Um, and studies range all over the place from 40 to 65. And we use or sometimes even up to 85 for their older population. So we use other studies to come up with these age cutoffs to try to find that tipping point. So we used um, data, uh, use, uh, data from Arkansas Department of Corrections. So the sample consisted of um, 4,793 inmates. And we looked at um, those who served a minimum of two years. And we looked at 730 days, um, their misconduct within the two year time frame for being released. Um, and that data came from 2013 and 2014. So our misconduct variable, um, it ranged, uh, we looked at counts of misconduct reports that were uh, people were gotten um, punished for. And it ranged from zero to 32. I found that a lot, there was this kind of uneven amount. You know, there are a lot of people about um, three fifths of that population had no misconduct reports. So we saw a lot of misconduct being some certain individuals just having a ton up to 32. So what we did um, for the misconduct, we turned into a binary, um, whether or not they received uh, a misconduct punishment um, or not. So that was our dependent variable. Um, age was an independent variable. We did one model um, where we used it as a continuous variable, and then we um, tested our different age categories. And these are other variables that we use um, for control. Um, so for our analysis, we did a series of binary logic um, distinct regression because of our dependent variable was binary and that's um, the best type of uh, model for our data. Um, there are some limitations um, to our study, one being that we're using secondary data. Um, this data was collected for correctional purposes, not for our research purposes. So there could be a lot of um, input errors there and we're using a proxy measure for behavior, which is misconduct. So um, yeah, so it's, and it's, um, just focus on Arkansas, so yeah, shouldn't be generalized to, to other states. So these are different age groups that we um, used. So we looked at 40 and older, compared it to 39 and under, all the way up to 55 and older and 54. And um, under, um, after we got over 55, the uh, it's just kind of slim after that. So we wanted to make sure we had um, enough to, um, power to run certain models. 
So this is kind of ugly, I apologize. Um, a little blurry. So uh, as you see here, reverse model, we used age as continuing uh, variable. So we're looking at um, significance. Um, so anything that has a little asterisk, and then this is the odds ratio. So anything that's significant has an asterisk. And to interpret odds ratio, anything that's over one means it increased um, the significance or uh, the probability. Um, and then anything under one means it decreased the probability of misconduct. So as you can see here, um, you see married, um, marriage, um, no longer married. So certain types of um, offenders also, this is one using age of continuous variable, being a violent offender increased their likelihood um, or the odds of being involved in misconduct. Um, and then going over here, looking at age, we see that compared to the younger groups, um, age significantly um, decreased the probability of misconduct. And that started at 40. And then um, looking at the predicted probability of being involved in misconduct, at about 20 years of age, about 51% um, percent predicted probability, and then all the way to 85 went down to about 17%. So it means that the likelihood of being involved in misconduct decreased over, over time. Another ugly table. <laughs> but uh, So now we're comparing under 40 to, um, uh, so 39 and uh, younger to 40 and older. So we see here that the odds ratio, um, certain things no longer married, um, actually decreased their um, uh, odds ratio of being involved in misconduct. Same thing for a number of dependents. Um, being non-white increased, so if you increase the chances of being involved in misconduct, same thing with violent, being a violent offender, property offender, um, sex offender, and then being a drug offender actually decreased. So that's kind of interesting finding there. Um, and then for the over, we see that being married actually decreased the probability of being involved in misconduct. Um, education attainment decreased, being non-white increased, violent offender increased, um, or sex offender increased, and length of stay um, was significant, but didn't really much. <laughs> kind of um, decreased their involvement just slightly. So how is this helpful? <laughs> so one showing that the tipping point was 40, meaning that the behavior of these inmates um, um, changed directly around that point in terms of misconduct. So this could be useful for the Arkansas Department of Corrections in determining how to divvy up resources and maybe even divide up their inmates. So lower amount of misconduct um, risk, you can house people 40 and over together. That means that they would have um, maybe less correct, fewer correctional staff that needed in that unit. Um, also for his programming too, um, focusing at the needs of people 40 and over. You can divide them, house them in separate units, or maybe even make a treatment programs, 40 and older. Um, and then also for future research, you know, for other correction facilities to kind of do the same, maybe look at different types of misconduct because they're kind of lumped together in this study. Um, and then um, my plan for future research is to focus on community corrections and look at the special needs that um, these populations have out in the community and kind of how COVID has affected being placed in, for instance, like housing or just finding availability of different treatment um, facilities. So um, this is a great resource um, I use for my class. Um, just if you're interested in learning more about any of these special populations, it covers all of these populations. And just my references. And then finally to the question portion. <laughs> So if we have any questions in the room, and I'd also encourage people that are watching uh, on Zoom to be able to throw something onto the chat if, if that's what you want to do. Any questions? Anyone? Yeah. 
I'm wondering how widespread the specialty courts are. Like I sort of vaguely heard of things like that, but they didn't. Yeah, so I actually have um, just because like I think I had the number on the slide. Oh, perfect. But I was, you know, talking and I have a lot of content on my slides. So. Oh, down here, oh, um, a little over 3,000. Okay. Um, and then it might have changed. This is the most recent yeah. stats I could find. Okay. Probably more. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So based on the kind of research um, that you're doing that, that has the potential for a practical application, um, I think one of the issues that, that comes up in, in the social sciences and you know, maybe in other disciplines or other fields as well, uh, I'm not sure, but often, um, you know, academics will will conduct research and they'll they'll find correlations that that have meaning, and that information could then have applicability to what I'll call the real world. So, so you take your academic findings and you you try to move them into the world where they would do some good. Um, how easy or hard I think has it been for let's say the work that that, that academics are producing to somehow shift into the realm of reality for the corrections uh, or the whole court system really. So that, you know, someone will say, well, first of all, are they going to, you know, read that journal article yeah. where the information is, is hidden in, in a journal somewhere that they may not have easy access to? Um, or how is that information potentially made accessible to them so that they, they can potentially use it? I guess, how open are they to using it. Yeah, so all this stuff does get stuck in the ivory tower, you know, um, but there's been a push for like conferences, trying to get that information out. Um, it's working with Department of Corrections in Alaska, they're very open and they want, they want to know what they're doing is effective. And um, so yeah, this one is, is, is difficult. I mean, I tried to put research in when I teach classes. It's one way we can disseminate that, but attending conferences and getting that information and inviting students to, to attend. Um, they have the um, conference focus uh, that inviting practitioners to um, the American Society of Criminal Justice. They have a big conference that they invite practitioners and, and um, I know in Alaska, they had a reentry conference where they invite people from the community that works in different aspects and is sharing information. And that's where I first heard that crisis now model was at that. And they now have implemented in Alaska. So that's really cool. But it can be difficult. Did I answer? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, mm -hmm. I think for social science, in many cases, what you're trying to do is, is come up with something that's going to help people within the larger context of society. And I'm just wondering about that bridge between the academic ivory tower uh, and the implementation in, you know, in the real world. And I can imagine that, that a number of these types of topics um, and, and simply the situations where you're, you're dealing with an incarcerated population, um, that this is a minefield of, you know, how do you get those two things to come together in, in some reasonably productive way, you know, not even considering things like cost, for example. Yeah. And then also too, when you're um, you know, going for your IRB, you know, you want to have permission from the correct facility. So if you already have a relationship there and you're reaching out and being like, hey, um, you know, this is going to be beneficial for me to make, um, you know, write these articles, get them in journals, but also too, I can give you back this information and um, I can be more than happy to come in and, and talk about it. Um, with your employers or just any, anything you need. Um, I've joined conferences. I've sat in a lot of meetings that have happened in corrections and they're pretty, they're really open in my experience. Do you find that areas with the larger like population density are more um, inclined to look for solutions? So it, with your California example in the gold coats, um, was there like a high crime rate in that area? So there was more of an incentive to implement these new ideas. What I found is a lot of um, just perceptions on um, what the criminal justice should be doing. So 
Um, in states where there's more punitive approach to it, they might not be as more inclined to accept something that's kind of, you know, might be seen softer yeah. on, on crime. So I think it's more to do with the political um, atmosphere of the region. When you see like things being implemented like that, this kind of new approach to dealing with. Mm -hmm. yeah, no problem. There's an online question, Dr. Barlow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Augustin. Out of all the special populations you study, where do you think there is the greatest need? That is, which population is receiving the least consideration for suffering or suffering the most? Uh, I, I probably, um, I'll probably say this because um, I, my interest kind of was pulled towards the older prison population because of that need. But another area would probably be um, women and transgender right now. Um, there's, um, you know, I talked about that shackling, but still being an issue, making sure older women are receiving, but also two older transgender inmates are so kind of combining these special populations together. I was really impressed with the example you showed with the gold coats. And it, it seems obvious the impact it's having on the inmates who need that support. But has there been any research on the effect it's having on the people provide the caregivers? Yeah, so um, I can't think of any say, but um, they've been a lot of interview type um, research um, where they've gone in and they've talked and you know been able to share their stories about how it's affecting them. Um, but a lot of them feel um, that they're kind of you know, painted forward. Also too, they might have family members that um, one of the gentlemen uh, in a different video, he was talking about how his mother has dementia. And so he just thinks about her. But there is um, you know, the research on inmates that are preparing for potentially dying in prison and knowing that they're never gonna get out um, and try to deal with that and how corrections can help them too. And same thing with correctional officers too. They need support as well when handling um, situations like that. Did that answer? Cool. Are there any success stories that um, you, know, you could point to around these issues, like have things move forward for, for example, transgender population in the way they have in schools and colleges and uh, like places where like this place has it right in terms of this initiative. Yeah, so there's um, a lot of advocacy groups and have been kind of, um, you know, getting their voice out there for transgender inmates, um, you know, the housing, you know, we should be housing them where they want to be housed and not be putting in um, to um, segregation. Um, also to like um, certain policies with like hormone replacement ther therapy. A lot of crash facilities were focused on freezing where, you know, wherever they were at when they came in, they just stopped. So if they were getting that therapy before, they could continue. But if they wanted to get it, they couldn't. Um, so they're seeing these advocacy groups really pushing and they're seeing rights change. Um, the correction facilities taking, you know, ending that freeze policy. So that's a step in the right direction. And then placing um, transgender inmates where they want to be placed, you know, and changing their, updating their policies to make sure that they're more um, accommodating. That. Yeah, so you do feel like there's positive signs. Yeah, um, still a long way to, to go. I've been um, keeping an eye on the news about um, you know changes in policies. It's been getting a lot of attention um, because of the segregation being kind of a go-to. I guess the follow up question for federal prisons are the policies and practices and protocols are they set at the federal level or at the individual institution? So, level? yeah, there's a um, different. So, there's the federal level has their own policies, um, and then each state has their own policies too. And sometimes, even within their correction facilities, too, they have their own policies that they follow. So, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I'm assuming that you know all the data that you've been looking at is, is primarily in the United States. Are there other countries that seem like they're ahead of the, the curve compared to us in relation to dealing with special populations? And you know, where are they maybe ahead of us, or where are they more successful uh, in terms of sort of these these wide ranges of different populations that, that have different sort of needs uh, throughout? 
you know, their particular country. Yeah, so um, one, I kind of tend to focus more on reentry and kind of what they do is the Holden prison in Nor Norway. They, um, their design is completely different than a uh, maximum security prison. Um, there's this really good documentary that compares Holden versus Attica. Um, and so each inmate is given their own room and has their own private bathroom um, where they have some sort of privacy, they can wear their own clothes, they're taught. Um, they're given like a budget, um, you know, where they can buy certain things or they can cook together. Um, it's just, uh, and guards are told it's okay to really interact and like you'll see guards and inmates kind of playing games together. Um, so it's just more conducive to making them feel more humanized in that hold in prison. And I view that, I, I mean, I haven't really looked at special populations within there, but just how they're treating inmates in general in, in that prison um, has led to way lower recidivism rates when they get out. Um, and they talk about that. And they have more programs too. Um, for instance, you have like a culinary program within that prison. Because a lot of people are probably going to end up in like the food service industry and other types of um, occupations that they're being trained. But again, I haven't really focused on the special population. But I feel like just that prison in general is more um, getting more beneficial for image when it comes to reentry. So let me play devil's advocate a little bit with with that example, just you know, to see what the reply would be. I think I've seen part of that documentary and, and you know, the, the rooms look like college rooms and the grounds look like nice yeah. grounds and the, you know, the, the food and the, the, the settings and things like that seem um, very not so bad. And, and I think that, you know, one could make an argument, well, that's a lot of resources and that doesn't seem like something that, that society should do for people that have committed heinous crimes, et cetera. But, you know, I, I can easily see the, the moral argument there main argument, but is there an economic argument that supports that model as opposed to as opposed to the model that we have where people are growing old very expensively in prison and you know the prisons aren't 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 designed to handle them and the resources are strained. Is there a, a cold-blooded economic argument? Yeah I mean the more we can set people up for success um, like in you know in prison with programming out in the community um, and we have lower recidivism rates, and it's been shown the research lower than that's saving money because uh, you know there's a process of working people through the criminal justice is, uh, a lot. So it's cost saving if you're you know if it is lower recidivism rates to do things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Have people studied that and sort of made an economic case of that sort? Yeah, they do look at um, different types of programs. Um, uh, with that, the Holden um, they do tout that. It lowers recidivism rates, so it's saving them money in the long run, so they can implement. It. So we do implement more and more programming for the inmates. So they call it like justice reinvestment, where you can save money um, by um, you know, reducing recidivism or doing things that are evidence based that are being shown to be effective. And if they are lowering recidivism rates, you can save money from the criminal justice process and reinvest it somewhere else. I, I don't know if you, if there's a big, large amount of case of history and case that in the laws in which inmates take their Eighth Amendment rights to the courts. Mm -hmm. um, and when they make that argument that the punishment is both cruel and unusual, which the Eighth Amendment links the two together, because a lot of things happen in, in institutions that we could see as cruel, but the argument would be that it's not unusual. Is there any is there any kind of pattern where the courts are kind of looking at that and cross-referencing it with the special populations and how they intersect? Like with your with your research, might did the courts would they take into consideration what would be usual or unusual in terms of the elderly population? Is that something that's in the case law at all? Yeah, so there's been different um cases being brought to the Supreme Court, but when it comes to figuring out something's cruel and unusual, they use the totality of conditions. That's where they're, um, so they're saying like one thing might be going on, which might not be great. Um, so for instance, like there might be overcrowding. So this happened in California, like overcrowding. So um, you have overcrowding happening. So yeah, that's not a really good condition to be in, but there's other things that are going on. Um, so lack of medical care, access to 
um, nutrition. And so when the court looked at all of those conditions together, they're like, yes, you need to do something about this overcrowding. That's why the, I believe it's 2011, there's this panic in uh, California that you need to reduce your prison population because it is deemed cruel and unusual and make some changes. So the court can't step in, um, but they're usually gonna look at, um, and you have to show that there's a, a problem within that facility. So you can't just use stats and say, hey, you know, overall we're seeing this um, issue, but you have to prove it's happening within that facility for them to step in. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah.